Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of the Bleed Los Podcast. This week's podcast is presented by Bet Online. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the online resource for all of your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head on over to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code, which is Believe50, B-L-E-A-V-50, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Huge thanks to them for presenting this week's episode of the podcast. Uh, we're going to we're gonna take a little stroll down memory lane. The, uh, the first half, I mean, technically the first half already passed, but the All-Star game is the, uh, is the, uh, is the, the, the thing that everyone kind of makes you go to the first half and uh and let's kind of go back and look you uh we, we talked about the sky was falling for a while i think everything's okay or as you would say juan no pasa nada i uh was curious is there anything that stands out for you in the first half as you kind of go back and look at uh you know kind of everything from obviously the season starting late injuries to where we are now <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, it, as much as doom and gloom as we went over, when you look at the end of the first half, they're right where we expected them to be. They're on pace to win more than 100 games. I don't think, I think I heard a stat the other day, I don't think they've ever won, or maybe this is the, the fifth best record that they've had at the All-Star break. So... I, I don't know. We probably, if we look back on what we've been talking about this whole first half, we probably look foolish because here we are panicking about a team that has the best record in the National League. They're not that far from having the best record in all of Major League Baseball. Yes. What percentage but, point they do. Well, okay. There we go. So it, it's just like, what what were we worrying about? I, yeah, look, before I, we're going to break down specific moments in the season but before we we do that i just want to make this metaphor right here or <laughs> this comparison or whatever the dodgers were expect there was a lot expected of the dodgers this season right and maybe they might have been underwhelming but i will say this you know who hasn't been underwhelming exactly. the bleedless podcast because wow. i have to say this but this is our second season doing this and i think we've been killing it this year I, I I mean the the guests that we've had this season, I I don't I never anticipated that we would have the quality of guests that we've gotten. So I I think that the Bleedless podcast has shown tremendous growth and now has become a powerhouse in in Dodgers baseball media. And she's not on the show right now. You guys are all probably wondering where Alicia Del Valle is. Alicia's on assignment right now. But I think one of the biggest moments of the first half has to be Alicia Del Valle joining the Bleedless podcast. And I think we have a clip of when she we made that announcement, right, Babyface? Yeah, let's roll it. I would like to extend an offer uh, to you that, I mean, we're, we're going to try to make it as attractive as possible because this economy is rough, right? Because, I mean, Juan doesn't even drive to work anymore because he's so upset. So... We would like you, since you're a free agent, to potentially join our podcast. Uh, starting salary is zero dollars. There is oh, no benefits. Okay. We we can talk baseball, yes. uh, and occasionally we'll have uh, some well-known people on, like Carlos Mencia, to discuss <laughs> bike clubs. Stop. So <laughs> if if that, I mean, listen, no offense to Carlos, but he kind of got himself caught up. Let's just be real for what it is. All yeah. seriousness, though. Uh, if uh, if that is an attractive offer for you, we would love for you to uh, to join us here at Bleed Los Media. Okay, just so I understand, sure. and you are recording this. Uh, it is being recorded. I, I would become a co-host with you gentlemen, uh -huh. and we get to talk baseball and tacos and LA love because I am LA woman. Wink, wink. Um, but I don't get any monies and no benefits. Is that correct? correct? That is all correct. No you get, you get, you get kind of sell <laughs> shirts. Well, you get kind of sell shirts, yeah. I mean, you'll get <laughs> occasionally you'll get a hat. 
Babyface uh, sent me a hat. Oh, and okay. So then you, they're, they're, you're already paid for the year. Too. Like you, you have you have received your compensation for all of 2022. I don't know why you sent it to me. Thank you, Babyface. Because look at it's like decision day. I am going with bleed lows. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Well, welcome aboard. Uh, Thank you. I can't wait for uh, for you to join Juan's Fight Club. I am it's a friend of the carne asada. Thank you, guys. All right. So uh, right, right there, I, I, I just want to point out that Alicia still has not joined my Fight Club. Okay, things <laughs> things are going great with Alicia. I think she's added. I think her feminine energy has added a lot. Uh, I had one of our listeners actually tell me this, and and, and I want to before I lose track of this, I want to thank everyone that came out to the All Star Game watch party. My apologies that I was not there in person. I I had some feedback there that everyone uh, enjoys Alicia's perkiness, and now I have been dubbed the Prince of Darkness, and that's because of you guys. Well, uh... I don't think I'm an a hole, but apparently. My Prince of Darkness balances well Alicia's perkiness, is what I was told. There is a right that we need to wrong here, Juan. Um, What's that, sir? The, uh, you kept saying we were talking about doom and gloom. We, was that, that's not true. That's, that's, that's simply not true. Uh, you, for sure, uh, dare I even say babyface, yes. Pero I did not say, if anything, I would always say, hey, bro, uh, they'll be fine. Talk to me after the All-Star game. It's now after the All-Star game. Uh, I would like uh, a correction to be issued on that because how dare you? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I will say this. You are definitely the voice of reason on the show. You are the one. If anyone should have coined the phrase, no pasa nada, it should have been you. Right. I mean, but, you're you, the one that keeps it real. Alicia's the perky one, and I am, I guess, the prince of darkness, according to our listeners. Which is a fair, I feel like that's a fair comparison. Uh, no, it, it has been fun having Alicia on and getting to know her uh you know uh, this way i guess for lack of a better term um then it's it's again uh, the the princess of picolandia uh, also yes. another uh another moniker for her. the uh, the paula abdul of the show i don't remember who came up with that um but I simeon simeon came that's up who it was that. yeah simeon uh shout out to simeon for uh for coming up with the uh, the paula abdul wait so so does that so based on that does that mean that I'm Randy Jackson and you are Simon Cowell? I guess it can, apparently I am. I do not believe that I come off that negative. And it could be because everybody is upset about my uh, apparent attack on flour tortilla, tar tortillas de harina. Look, I, I want a clarification here, people. Sure. All I, I'm just educating you guys. I don't hate tortillas de harina. I, I really don't. We, we, I just just, them. we had some flour tortillas last week and they were pretty we did. good. So I, I mean, I get it. I, it is and by we that's... also does not include one. We <laughs> everyone but one. Some of our listeners apparently are starting to get a little. Uh, you know, they're a little sensitive to the apparent attack that I make on tortillas harina, and I, I just don't think I'm that bad. I really don't. I guess I'm just completely. I have no self awareness. Has a just the, just the follow up question, just so we can kind of gauge this right. Has your kid ever said that you're cringe? No, not yet, but okay. she uh, she does do this. And for those of you listening on the audio, it's She's like I vergüenza, que vergüenza, yeah. yeah. you know. So, so, so it's so it's it's approaching cringe cringe status. We're not too far off. Oh, but let me tell you, she loves Juan Soto, and she has no problems asking me, "Are we going to go to the game this week?" So, <laughs> she has no problem being seen in public if we're going to go to a Dodger game. Well, if Juan Soto's there. Look, one thing I will be very, pr I'm very proud of. She was an Angel fan, and now huh? she has become a Dodger fan. So, well, it's because of your slander towards the Los Angeles Angels of Playa Larga of Orange County. That's, that's exactly. They should take that deal. They should. But I mean, back to your original question, though. I, I you know, looking back on it, Alonso, mm -hmm. how can we not say that the first half was not dominated by Freddie Freeman? When it comes to what was happening in spring training and then the telenovela that Babyface coined, which is Dos Equipos, Un Camino. Uh -huh. I, I, I mean, is there a bigger storyline than especially the season he's having I than mean, what Freddie Freeman has brought to the Dodgers? Here's the funny thing about the Dodgers. Obviously, Freddie Freeman, the, the, that whole thing, you know, from the offseason after, you know, everyone was able to conduct business, how that quickly came together and then now... Uh, him, Trey Turner, and Mookie Betts are kind of your big three. 
you know, for the time being. Uh, did not have that in my bingo card because I, I mean, I told you all along, I didn't think Freddie was coming to LA. I was was completely. And the funny thing is that was kind of the uh, the go to, right? Like right now, you know, as you mentioned, Juan Soto, the trade rumors right out the gate are like, oh, the Dodgers are going to go get him. And I unpopularly said, uh, I don't think the Dodgers should go get him, nor do I think they will. Um, also, now that we know the asking price for Juan Soto, I don't think anyone's going to get him unless it's maybe like the Padres or the Mets, you know, someone that that is trying to do kind of a sexy move. But anyway, with Freddie, uh, dude, I and the thing I did not expect either with Freddie was the telenovela. That completely blindsided me, especially with how kind of, for lack of a, you know, I don't even, I don't even think that's fair. I was going to say it got ugly, but I don't think that's fair. I feel like it just kind of got blown out of proportion. Yeah. Um, especially with uh with kind of his return, you know, because obviously they play in the NL. He's going to have to go back at some point. Um, but, I mean, all, all things considered, I think Freddie Freeman's going to be okay because he's uh, he's been on a little bit of a tear. He's He himself foresaw it coming, and that just kind of adds to the novella. Well, yeah, I mean, think about it. I think the reason why I say he exemplifies the Dodgers' first half, mm -hmm. if you look at this guy's numbers, the guy is hitting three twenty five right now. He has 62 RBIs and 15 home runs. That's kind of what you expected him, yeah. right, of yeah. Freddie Freeman. Yeah. The Dodgers are in first place. They're like 30 games over 500. I don't know if I expected the Dodgers to be this good in terms of being 30 games over 500, especially in a division where, where the, the show pods. <laughs> well, uh, the Giants obviously are struggling. The Giants yeah. don't have the same voodoo magic that was happening. But that's been a surprise. Or, yeah. or let me ask you this. Are we looking at this the wrong way in the sense that the Giants are who the Giants are? It's just that the Dodgers aren't that good. I mean, the Dodgers are, let's just get that out of the way. They're they're an all-star roster, right? They're, yeah. a, you know, some dare would even say kind of like, you know, a super team, kind of like that Golden State Warrior thing. Um, the Padres have good pitching. You know, they obviously have to fill some holes. We've, we've talked about that a bunch. The Giants should be better. They're underperforming. There's just no other way to put it, right? But they've also been hampered by injuries and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of – so I don't think last year was a fluke. I, I'm surprised that they're currently 48 and 47 as of the recording of this. Um, Arizona and Colorado are honestly – Last year I was a fluke. I've said it since last year, and I keep saying – told you guys at the beginning of this year, last year was a fluke. Remember uh, – I know they won 107 games, whatever, but it was a fluke. I mean, Cross was playing out of his mind. Belt was playing out of his mind. I mean, it was because because of um, Buster leaving the team. That team was playing out of their mind for Buster Posey, and now this year things just went back to normal. Can I say what what is a, a little bit of a surprise? Yeah. Uh, how not great the NL Central is. I'm kind of surprised by that. Like everyone there is kind of, eh. You know, like there's yeah. no one. There's not really anyone. Like now, if the Cardinals go out and get a Juan Soto, okay, you have my attention. Now. But um, but even then, I mean, they're you know the Cardinals are two and a half back from the Milwaukee Brewers, and they're fifty one and forty six. I'm kind of surprised by that, especially because the Milwaukee Brewers kind of threw in the white flag. You know, the the indicator for that for me was when they got rid of Lorenzo Cain. Yeah, they you know we're done. Thanks, bro. Thanks for everything. I'm I'm kind of shocked by that. Um, but uh, not. Not to anyone's surprise, the Mets are, are kind of turning and riding that ship too. I mean, they're in first back in the East with the Braves right behind them. But I am way surprised that the Phillies are still underperforming. That's that's another big surprise in the NL. Uh, it's been a weird year. I, I will say that because the Dodgers. But again, this all kind of comes back to the one thing that we talked about. And I know it gets kind of lost in the freight now. The season started late. It messed with a lot of guys' stuff. And here we are now. I know that's going to be like, oh, that's an excuse. But at the same time. It all started late. Everyone kind of had to like scramble to get things going, scramble to get through spring training, and then here we are now. I mean, I know that sounds like a cop out to the players, but hey, I feel like that's that's fair. You know, before we leave the Freddie Freeman, I, I just want to point this out. Yeah. Where would the Dodgers be if they didn't sign Freddie Freeman? Because there's been a lot of underperformance in the first half. In particular, we're looking at Max Muncy. Uh Cody Bellinger, I think now we have to start asking ourselves, is this who Cody Bellinger is? Am I, I think people were expecting at the beginning of the year when Jeff Passan and everybody was saying this was going to be the greatest Dodger lineup. And if you look at their run differential, 
it is the best in the National League, but the Yankees have a run differential right now of over 200. So yeah. the Yankees right now look like they have the greatest lineup that ever lived. Um, but the Max Muncy thing to me is interesting. And going back, Max Muncy was a guest on the show in the beginning of the season. I, I know people will say, to, to your point, Alonso, that you can't use this as an injury. But I, I do, have you found yourself, do we need to start asking the question, is this still the season that Muncy is having? Is it because he hasn't recovered from the injury? Or is this now what we're seeing Max Muncy? This is who Max Muncy is. And why, why don't we hear it from Max Muncy himself in terms of him talking about his injury? Uh, Babyface, we have a clip, right, of Muncy? Yeah. I ask you, how's your, how's your arm? I know you know you kind of broke some you know broke the internet a little bit Dodgers internet and in talking about your elbow and, and everything that's gone on with it. How, how's the arm holding up? Uh, it's getting better. Um, you know we're getting there. It's it's a it's a it's a slow process, but everything's moving as it should. And uh, you know we're actually going to start swinging a bat here pretty soon. So you know that's the things are looking really good, and uh, uh, you know things are looking good for the season. Uh, you know whenever that may end up being, but. Um, you know, it's a uh, yeah. It was a really unfortunate uh, injury, and you know, it sucked. And uh, but uh, you know, it's just one of those things that just it happens. It's part of the sport, uh, uh, and you know, can't complain about it too much. Hey Max, uh, when that injury happened, did you think it was as bad as it was, or did you just think uh, it's a stinger? I'll, I'll I'll be fine. I'll be fine. No, as soon as it happened, I knew it was pretty much worst case scenario for me. Um, that's the most pain I've ever been in in my life, without a doubt. Uh, as soon as he hit my elbow and I rolled on the ground, I felt it pop out. And when I was on the ground, I ended up rolling my whole body on top of it, um, which most people are probably going to say that was a dumb idea. That actually made it feel better and it popped it back into place. Um, but, you know, when they came out there, they were asking me if I was all right. If I was all right, I said, get me off this field so I can go pass out in pain. Um, you know, it's just, it just one of those things where I knew right away. And, you know, we went and got the MRI that day and uh, we got the results back. So we knew immediately. And, and uh, uh, it was worst case scenario. But uh, because of how things happened, it ended up being the best of worst case scenario. So, you know, it was my, my left arm. Um, you know, we tore the UCL, we tore a couple other ligaments, shredded the muscles, dislocated the elbow. Um, it was basically a total blowout almost, but because it was my left arm, uh, I didn't need surgery because of how the ligament was, um, laying on the arm. It didn't need to be surgically reattached. It would heal on its own and kind of scar over. Um, and because it's my back arm swinging, uh, it was another reason why we didn't have to have surgery. So uh, like I said, it was worst case scenario, but it was kind of the best of worst case scenario for me. Um, you know, missing the playoffs sucked, but uh, we should be ready for this year. And, you know, we'll see how things go once we start getting really into baseball here. So, uh, Alonzo, let me uh, let me ask this uh, to you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm starting to see this a lot on Twitter. And I think the person who's leading this parade is Howard Cole. Uh, the question of how much time are you, how many more opportunities are you going to give Max Muncy? Uh, because it doesn't look like it's getting better. You know, I, I so I watched him, uh, I think it was Saturday. I watched him for a little bit, um, uh, take you know, some of the at bats. My man's frustrated, he's pissed. Like when you watch those at bats, yeah. it's like he, he's he, he's he, it's one of those where okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. What, what's wrong here, right? And that's kind of on that that's on Max Muncy like because he's one of the most patient hitters in the game, right? But that kind of tells you that the mental toll that it's taken on him. So defensively, I don't necessarily think it's an issue. It's just it's just the bat, right? And that's unfortunate because you know one of the things that Max is kind of known for is his clutchness and all that stuff. So I don't I don't know. Truthfully, I don't know what what they're gonna do there because. He's also a core guy is kind of how they look at him, right? You know, he, he's he's an integral part of the team is, is how they treat him. Obviously, they trust him because they've kept him in the lineup. So, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take for them to be like, hey, okay, maybe he needs maybe he needs to take a few days off. You know, we, we, we let him sit, you know. Okay, in, some in some guys, that's how it works. And other guys, you know, Max, if we've learned anything about Max, he's an intense guy. Nothing wrong with that. He's a gamer. 
you know, it might be it might be detrimental for him to take a few days off. So who knows, right? So I don't know. I honestly that that's that's kind of a loaded question that I don't think anyone really knows the answer to except Max Muncy. Hey, babyface, what, what do you think? I mean, it might be just out of necessity. I mean, with Justin Turner being out and Chris Taylor's out, who else can you put at third base? I mean, Jake Lamb, right? He's an infielder. He can he can he can fill in. But I mean, how much is it? Is it that injury? I mean, should he have had that? that you know tommy john or whatever to to get that fixed and 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 you know been out this season you know is he is it gonna take you know i don't know if they can still go back and have surgery at the end of this year like to correct it i mean how much of what he's doing right now is it because of that that elbow well i mean i guess that's the question i i I mean that's what baseball is how many times have we seen guys have three or four really great seasons and then after that I mean, look, we mentioned it earlier. Maybe that's what Cody Bellinger is. Maybe Cody Bellinger had three or four good seasons, and now what we're seeing is who Cody Bellinger is. Look, I can't stress this enough. Whenever I see someone have success, especially early in their career, I'm always just like, okay, now the league is going to adjust to him, and let's see how he reacts to that, right? Because now the player then has to... Look, these are Major League Baseball players, and everybody has tape on you. If They're going to identify what your weakness is, and then they're just going to attack that. And you, as the player, you have to make an adjustment to that. So, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is this... I, I'm pivoting to, to Cody Bellinger, Alonzo. What are you seeing with Cody Bellinger? So, can I play devil's advocate for a second with Cody? Absolutely. I think... So, but yeah, I'm the Prince of Darkness. But yeah, you go ahead. You play devil's advocate. Well, the reason I'm going to play devil's advocate is because you know, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, this is this is his ceiling, right? Yeah. What if his ceiling is he's a big-time clutch hitter? And then there's, there's a history of that, right? In yeah. Major League Baseball. There's guys who just play really well in the postseason. And he did look different in the postseason last year. So, I mean, because here's the thing, I, I, I've there's something that's stuck with me from, we don't have a clip of it, but it's it was one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done, the one with Eric Karros. And Eric Karros said, okay, do you, you know the Dodgers, or do you know they're going to make the postseason? You can book that right now. You can bet online. Shout out to bet online again. That they're, <laughs> well played, they're, sir. Well played. They're, they're going to be in the postseason, right? Now, when they get to the postseason, it's a different story, right? As we saw this last postseason, and not to be overly critical, it's just what we saw. You know, the likes of Trey Turner weren't, you know, didn't show up. You know, the same Trey that was there that they acquired, all you know, all that stuff. And not to single him out, I'm just using that as an example because some of these guys play completely different when the bright lights are on, right? And and I think Trey Turner is going to write that shit. I think he's going to write that wrong. I'm not overly worried about that, but. You know, Cody, I think his his time to shine is in the postseason. And that's kind of what you're after, right? You want these guys to go out and, and yeah, you know, do what they need to do during the regular season. Do you would you like them to all be MVP candidates and all stars and all that? hundred percent, right? But you already kind of have your usual suspects who you expect to be those all stars, right? And then you have to have your role players. Look at the Warriors. Are the Warriors champions without their role players? No. So it's kind of the same thing with the Dodgers. You, you have your usual suspects as warriors. I'm sorry, as, as role players. I think Cody Bellinger is, I don't necessarily think he's also a role player. He's an everyday player. But, you know, I, I, I'm not over, going to be overly critical of what he's kind of gone through because he also had a gnarly shoulder injury. Like, it wasn't anything light to take easy. So I think he's, you know, he's still figuring out doing what he needs to do, taking care of his body. But he's getting big hits along the way. And if that's what you're going to get out of him, hey, man, I'm cool with it because if he's hitting at the bottom of that lineup and the rest of those guys are getting on base, that's what you want because that's what's going to produce runs and manufacture runs. So I'm cool with that. I know that's not the sexiest answer, but at the same time, the Dodgers are in first place and they're 11 and a half up on the Padres. If that's what it's going to take to be in that position to get into the postseason, and if he continues to do that in the postseason, sick, sign me up. I'll take it all day. Babyface, what do you got to say about Bellinger? Yeah, I mean – I'll take the big hits in the, in the postseason. Um, it just seems that Bellinger, some days he looks he looks really good. You know, he has some good at-bats, and other at-bats are just like, 
Like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I mean, the day he hit the Grand Slam, right? He was down 0-2. And he came back, and he fought, and he fought, and he fought, and he got that hanging curve. And Grand Slam won that game for them, right? So those are the type of at-bats that I want to see Bellinger taking, but it's not, you know, it isn't consistent. You know, so it's like I said, sometimes he'll come up, and he'll look really bad. And then sometimes he has those good games. You know, he gets, you know, a couple of hits, home runs. So that's, if we can get more of that Bellinger, you know, during the regular season, you know, I'm not saying he's got to go out there and hit 300. You know, I don't think he's going to hit, you know, you know, 30 home runs, 100 RBIs. But, you know, he gets us 250, 25 bombs, you know, 80 RBIs. Who wouldn't take that, right, during the season? Well, yeah. But, I mean, here's, and again, this is the reason why I, I think all Dodger fans should really be grateful about this front office because we've talked about the signing of Freddie Freeman and having Freddie Freeman on this team. But the two other guys that we haven't talked about, and to me, I mean, these guys, in my opinion, are carrying this team, are Mookie Betts and Trey Turner. And why are these guys on the team? Because the front office was smart. You saw how they spent their money. The only the longest contract they've ever given was to, to Mookie Betts. Then they make the trade because they have the assets to go get Trey Turner. And this is one of those things where I know people are, especially people who aren't Dodger fans, are critical of the Dodgers saying that they're buying all, all this talent. But there is a plan here. And Alana Rizzo, we had Alana Rizzo on the show this season, and Alana Rizzo talked about how the Dodgers are, how their, their infrastructure, so to speak. Uh, go ahead and play the clip there, uh, Roger. That people lose sight of, Juan, is the fact that, as Alicia was saying, it's like we don't realize how <laughs> lucky we are to cover the team and to be a fan of a team that has gone to the World Series three times in the last, at this point, whatever it is, seven years or whatever it is. 17, 18, and 20. We don't, we take for granted, I think, how good this team is year in and year. And I do not want to hear the excuse one more time that this team spends money because there are teams that spend money that have not had the success that this team has had year in and year out. And by the way, this is a team that also has success every single year and does not completely deplete their farm system to have success. So I don't want to hear it anymore. I mean, and there you there you have it. I, I I mean, I think she said it uh, perfectly there. I mean, Alonso, what what are your thoughts on like to me what Mookie Betts is doing is just like that's why I loved Alex Verdugo, but if you can get a Mookie Betts, you go get a Mookie Betts. Okay. And after that, I, I I don't know anybody who wouldn't want Trey Turner. Uh, watching this guy play every day. I, I'm still, I understand it's business. I don't know why the Dodgers haven't locked up Trey Turner because you're going to, you're going to, once he goes to the open market, it, you don't know what's going to happen. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on Mookie Betts and Trey Turner in the first half of the season. Mookie Betts is quietly the second best baseball on the planet, base, baseball player on the planet. The first is Mike Trout. And it's not, I mean, that's, I know Dodger fans would be like, oh, you know, you're, you're riding the coattails of Mike Trout. Bro, Mike Trout's the best player on the planet. Like, there's no other way to put it. If, if you don't, if you think that I'm crazy, go watch Mike Trout play. But Mookie Betts is set easily the second best player in, in baseball. And he's quietly done it. And the thing, and Eric Carroll, so I you know, hate to bring him up again because we don't have a clip, but he said it himself. They underpaid for Mookie Betts. If if they if they would have waited for you know all that stuff to play out, I honestly think that Mookie deal would have cost them way more money. Now Trey Turner, I, I still uh, to this day I still think it's one of the better trades the Dodgers have done because they obviously they did it for Max right, but the payoff was we get Trey Turner. Now Trey Turner is going to be an interesting offseason. Uh, uh, he's going to have an, an interesting offseason market because, I mean, I've said it here before. I know I was a little critical of him a few seconds ago, but I'll, I'll say it again. I trust in Trey. He's the best pl the best shortstop in all of baseball. It's not even, in my opinion, it's not even close. I know my opinion doesn't matter because I'm just a little brown guy on a podcast, but what do I know, right? But, I mean, th dude, the, just everything about Trey Turner, just on, on both sides, it's criminal how good that dude is. But what I like about Trey Turner is the rapport that he's built with these guys. You know, with you see him and Mookie and Freddie hanging out. That's your big three. You know, right? You know, in the NBA, they talk about their big threes. And Dodgers currently have a big three. And and for me, 
just watching Trey play, he plays the right way, but he's having a lot of fun, just like the rest of the guys are. And and I think they've adopted your mentality of Juan, Juan of uh, no pasa nada, because that's how they play. You know, they go out there and they're they're roughnecks and, and they do what they got to do, but they're having a lot of fun. And, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is you got to win those games, and, and and they've done it. Can I can I just say one thing, though? There's one game that stuck out to me this year, and, and they everyone kind of had impact on it, and I think that's kind of why we're here now. Uh Obviously, there was the, the flip-flops with the series, right, where they were going out and, and struggling against teams they shouldn't have been struggling with and all that stuff. The game on July 10th, when the, when the Dodgers came back to beat the Cubs 11-9, to uh, I think is what kind of, okay, we, this is what we are. This is who we are. And, and I think that series is the series where they kind of flipped that switch because ever since then, Freddie's been on a tear. Mookie's been on a tear. <laughs> Trey has been on a tear. So, and again, your usual suspects of guys – are, are doing what they're doing, and that's why you go out and get them. That's why you went out and got a trade turn. That's why you went out and got a Mookie Betts. And and I think uh, all credit to this front office, like you were saying earlier, that's that's why they're in this position. And obviously, this is the core guys too, right? But I mean, that that's why you go out and get a trade turn. That's why they made that move. Yeah, it was nice to have Max Scherzer, but trade Turner was the payoff. What about you, babyface? Yeah, I mean, I, I tweeted this out the other day. I mean, um, you have that one two of. Mookie and then Turner. It's like good luck, right? Just, just most teams, you're lucky if you have a dynamic leadoff hitter, right? Now the Dodgers got Mookie Betts and Trey Turner, and then you got Freddie Freeman after that. So it's like, I mean, good luck, right? It's like good luck to the rest of the league. And then, and then the Dodgers keep doing this. Then you have, you know, your other other guys. But then you have guys that you don't even expect. You got Trace Thompson in there producing. Jake Lamb producing. Guys, they find you know, just on the sidelines, and constantly the Dodgers keep doing this. They just bring guys in, they plug them in, and they start producing. So it's like, I don't see any other team doing what the Dodgers are doing. You know, it's funny that you say, Alonzo, that that the game that represented the first half, I think that was a good pick. But it's funny. I think you can say that about a, a lot of games this season that represented, like, that game in Philadelphia that they lost on the Muncie play. Is that game not more indicative of poor Max Muncie's season, right? The other day when Cody Bellinger hit the Grand Slam, and he got a curtain call. And then they let him go out and run on the field in the ninth inning by himself so the fans could give him more recognition. I mean, to me, that's a team that is just like, they see that this guy maybe is struggling. Maybe he needs this. I mean, that's, we went from earlier in the season when they were in San Francisco after they got swept, where Dave Roberts is calling them out for being selfish to now we see a team basically saying, hey, man, let, let's make sure that Cody gets his due. Like, the, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, maybe that Cubs series is the one that turned everything around, and now they're clicking, and they're just – everything seems to be a team win from this point. Right. It doesn't seem like it's someone is carrying them. I want to transition to this because I think in the going back to spring training, I heard a lot of this, and I think we talked about it too. What was the biggest concern for the Dodgers going into the season? And I think a lot of us had talked about pitching. And in particular, we haven't mentioned him, but the guy who we thought was going to be a problem this whole season, turns out I, I don't think anybody cares anymore about him, and that's Trevor Bauer. Like losing... You know, when we thought they're not making moves, it's because they're expecting Trevor Bauer to come back. Well, it turns out Trevor Bauer's not coming back. And the Dodgers, I mean, they're, they're starting pitching. I, I think it is number one in all of Major League Baseball. I, I, I did not expect this. I, I have to say this is a surprise. The fact that you saw Clayton Kershaw in the first half of the season almost have an opportunity to throw two no-hitters two perfect games I, I i mean it it's crazy tyler anderson almost throwing a no hitter against the angels at, at dodger stadium and of course you can't say anything about i mean who is a bigger surprise the catman i mean the season that the catman is having that first half that he had was fantastic i i, I was kind of disappointed to see andrew heaney get hurt because i was curious to see what he was going to do if he stayed healthy uh, rumor is he's going to be in the rotation this uh, this week. So we'll see how Andrew Heaney looks like. But 
the the starting pitching for the Dodgers, I I have to say, I'm pleasantly surprised. At the same time, I am concerned if they can keep this up in the second half of the season. Well, and you also omitted Walker Buehler is down and out for a while, and yeah. Julio Arias has still been doing the thing, right? I mean, we, you know, I've said it a bunch here before, and and uh, I don't remember who it was, but they're like, well, it's not really nitpicking, but in all reality, you know, with a team this good and this balanced, you, you kind of end up nitpicking, right? And and I feel like Dodgers pitching, and I'm guilty of this too, has been unfairly nitpicked because they are the best pitching team in baseball. They're, they're better than the Astros by a two two ERA points, so um, two point nine six to the two point nine eight, and then from there it goes into the threes after those guys. So from for me, <clears throat> this in pit, pitching wins you championships, right? And I am still a firm believer that you need three starters to go out and win a championship. You know, you can go back and look at all these rotations for the last however long. They all have three guys, right? So if the Dodgers are going to win, they need their three guys. So obviously, you have your horse in Kershaw. You have Tyler Anderson. You have Julio Diaz. Then you throw in Tony Gonsolin, who, I, you know, obviously falls into that uh, probably ahead of Tyler Anderson. But still, Tony Gonsolin, man, good for that guy because he had all the tools in the world, and, and he said so himself. I know we don't have a clip of him, but uh, he said so himself when we had him on that it sounded like maybe there was some outside noise that was creeping in a little bit that, you know, that was messing with them and stuff. But but he was able to kind of right that ship. And obviously it doesn't hurt that you have a guy like Mark Pryor that's in your corner that uh, that can work with your magic. So I think, listen, man, there's just no, no bones about it. The Dodgers on both sides of the ball are pretty balanced. And, you know, kind of like Roger was saying a little bit ago, you look at their lineup and every day, top to bottom, it's a stacked lineup. I mean, when you have Cody Bellinger hitting in the eighth spot, and that guy, I mean, even though he's been struggling, that's still Cody Mellinger. That guy was an MVP not too long ago. That guy he hits bombs, right? He, you know, chicks dig the long ball. Or as the, that kid from the Little League World Series, I hit dingers. So it's, <laughs> it's you know, it's that's that's kind of what you expect with the Do- Dodgers team to have good balance top and bottom. And, you know, this that, that I'm not surprised. But the crazy thing is the Dodgers still may go get pitching. And Eric Carroll, so again, I hate to bring him up because we don't have a clip, said so himself. You got to go out and hoard pitching, and they've been signing kind of you know players that have been DFA'd and stuff like that that Pryor's going to work his magic with. But imagine if the Dodgers go out and get another start, and you know, and that leads me into the the trade deadline, right? And the trade deadline is next week, folks. I, I Which mean, is crazy. Is, yeah, <laughs> I mean, by. we just had the All Star game, and now we're going to go straight into the trade deadline. Uh, Babyface, before we start talking about possible possibilities for the Dodgers in the trade deadline. Who do you? I mean, what was your biggest surprise in terms of the Dodgers pitching staff in the first half? I mean, obviously you got to go with with. I'm gonna say Tyler Anderson, uh, just because you know we've seen Tyler Anderson before, you know, and we never thought, okay, he's you know he's at best what four number five. I mean, he's been out there dealing like you know an ace for some teams, right? He's you know he's had no hitters going into the seventh, eighth inning. I mean, every start is like. Sometimes, you know, there's no hits for, what, four or five innings. Like, this guy is out there, like, just doing stuff that these hitters are not, you know, they, they just don't know what's coming at him. And I think he's the biggest surprise that, you know, he, he's an all-star. Um, you know, the Dodgers just signed him on a whim. Just uh, They signed him, like, what was it, like a day before camp set out, right? Like they, it, they it was signed, close. It was a few days They signed him really, before. really late. And, I mean, what he's done for this team, you know, for this rotation after losing Bueller, you know, losing Kershaw early. I mean, I think uh, Tyler Anderson definitely has been the biggest surprise. You know, and, and it's it's interesting. You mentioned, I mean, he was an all-star. The Dodgers had six all-stars. You could very easily have made the argument that they should have had seven. The fact that Will Smith still didn't make the all-star team is very baffling to me. Eight, but, because Julio Diaz should have been an all-star too. And you, you could have made, I, I think that start against the Cubs, I think is what hurt Julio. Uh, but Julio's bounced back since then. And... But, but here's the thing, Alonso, you just said, I mean, this is a team, and you've said it before, it's, a, it's an all-star lineup. They could have had eight all-stars. But here we are, we're still talking about the trade deadline and what they're going to need to. And, you know, going back to that Karos interview that you talked about, and the, even David Vasse, I, I think the concern is is having an elite starter, adding an elite starter 
to that for the playoffs. Right now, to me, this trade deadline and what they're going to do is all about the playoffs. It's all about because the Dodgers are in, right? I think right. their magic number already is like either in the 60s or in the 50s. I think it's 54 as of today. 54 after today. So go, getting us into the trade deadline, uh, you know, in terms of the, the Juan Soto thing, I heard you guys talk about it at the All-Star Game watch party, and I agree with you, Alonso. I I would not make the trade as much as I love Juan Soto. I would not make the trade for Juan Soto now. I would not make it in season. I would revisit it. Hopefully he's still on the Nationals, and I would revisit it in the off season. But for right now, I I think you have to use your assets to get another starting pitching a pitcher. I think you need. Here's the thing about the bullpen. Yes, I I get it. The the bullpen looks a little shaky right now. But I got news for you guys. I don't think that Reyes Moranta or David Price are going to be closing out games in the ninth, the remainder of the season. Right. Dustin May is already on his rehab, and I know that they they've talked about. Dustin May going into the starting rotation, but realistically, I think maybe we're probably going to see Dustin May in the bullpen. So, and Blake Trinan has started throwing again. So you're going to have some reinforcements, and that's one of the things we haven't even talked about that the Dodgers have been doing this lose without Blake Trinan, without Daniel Husden, who were supposed to be key components to the bullpen. Craig Campbell, who everyone hates, has been shaky. <laughs> he's been shaky. But, hey, the last couple of times he's been out on the mound, he's done his job. So if Campbell starts pay- pitching better, uh, what I'm saying is is I-, I hear a lot of people say we need bullpen help. Coming right. to that trade deadline, I got to ask you guys, uh, what what is what is more important? Is it getting bullpen help or getting a, a starter? And also, who in the minor leagues do you think is going to go? Because we've had some minor league guests on there. We had Michael Bush. We've had Diego Cartaya. Those are all names that have been you know mentioned in terms of making a trade for Juan Soto. We had Miguel Vargas yeah. uh, on the show. Like to me. I think guys that I don't want to see the Dodgers lose are Bobby Miller. And, and I like Miguel Vargas. I, I, I really do like Miguel Gar- Vargas. I'm okay if they trade Cartaya, to tell you the truth. And I'm okay if they trade, you know, Michael Bush. Michael Bush is probably not going to come back on the show now because of that. But I, I, there's or, something. Or I, we, 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 have a, we have a clip of, of Miguel Vargas, uh, don't we, uh, uh, Babyface? Yeah. Do you have a favorite Major League Baseball team, or was it always just... And I, you keep saying Guriel, and I know it's killing my producer, Roger, over there, that you're saying that name, but we're not going to get into it. Uh, but was there a team, a Major League Baseball team, that you liked? Uh, I, I'm like, I like a more part, uh, like the players than teams. Because we always in Cuba, we like follow players. Mm-hmm. But right, right now, my favorite team is the Dodgers. Man. There you uh, go. <laughs> that's the easy. That's the easy question. That's, that's a easy softball question. question, and well done. Yeah, you that's easy. That. that was easy. Good answer. That was easy. Good answer. <laughs> now, here, this is what's going to endear you to more Dodger fans. Do you know who Fernando Valenzuela is? Of course, of course. Okay, so. so the same way that the Dominicans are about Big Papi and Pedro Martinez, that's how the Mexicans are about Fernando Valenzuela. That's how we are about Julio Urias yeah. now. You know, Julio Urias yeah. is our new Valenzuela, and we all, yeah. you know, we all root for, for Urias. I mean, look, th- that guy at the beginning of the season, when you saw the list of the minor leaguers, the prospects being ranked, I, I got to be honest with you guys. I was like, who the hell's Miguel Vargas? How did he climb up so quickly? And now, to me, I mean, he's killing it down in AAA. And honestly, I could see them bringing him up in the second half of the season. But he's going to lose at-bats. He's not going to play every day, especially with this lineup. So I understand why they don't bring him up. But who do you guys think are the prospects that might go in this trade deadline? Well, I mean, if, if I, and again, I don't think they're going to trade for Juan Soto. Let's just... Through, let's just preface that again. And real, and real quick, if they did get Juan Soto by the off chance, 
then I would make an I stand with Juan shirt. Only, only <laughs> that's the only but, way. Um, I also don't think the Dodgers need Juan Soto. Uh, if we're being yeah. completely honest. Um, and, and, and real quick before I even preface that too, uh, no disrespect to uh, well from Juan, I should say. Uh, Evan Phillips has been out there doing the damn thing. Yes. Um, the Yancy Almonte, who I. Yeah. I wanted the Dodgers to get him a long time ago, and I'm so stoked they got him. But then just the magic that Priors worked with him, it ain't right. Phil Bickford, you know, th- these are guys that have that have kind of carried the back end of the bullpen, right? Is there a question mark around Craig Kimbrell? I guess you could say that. But as you said, Juan, the last couple outings, you know, it's been, uh, uh, to quote uh, the, the great Michael Cole, it's been vintage <laughs> Craig Kimbrell. And, uh, and that's that's – you know, kind of what they went out to do, but also no disrespect to Alex Vesia. Alex yeah. Vesia has come up huge for the Los Angeles Dodgers throughout the season. There's that save of a couple, you know, a few weeks ago, a couple, no, a few days ago, I guess I should say, before the All-Star break, where he was jacked. And you know what? <clears throat> They're doing this without Blake Trinan right now. They're doing it, with, like you said, without Dustin May. And I have a hot take on Dustin May. I think he's going to go into the rotation. And the reason I think that is because he's starting games in rehab assignments. He's not coming in kind of in, you know, whenever after the first inning, second inning, he's starting him. So if they're starting him, that means they're getting him ready for starts. So I think he's going to be in the rotation. That's just my hot take. Isn't, isn't that what Vasse said? Like, they want to, they want to ex, you know, extend him so that, that he they have that option. If, yeah. they need to, if they need to use him, you know, for as a long relief or as a starter. Well, and, and again, it wouldn't shock me because the Dodgers, as we saw in the postseason, they've adopted the whole opener thing too. So... Again, I think they're going to throw him in the rotation because, I mean, I really hope Andrew Heaney's okay because I believe they, it was shoulder inflammation as to why he got thrown on the IL this go-around. I hope it, that's all it really is and nothing more. But if they can get Andrew Heaney and Dustin May back to be Andrew Heaney and Dustin May before their injuries, dog, that ain't fair. That's not a fair rotation. And and, uh, look, and, and real quick, Alonso, if that happens, look, my – I'm sorry, Mitch White, because we have taken you for granted. Mitch White 100%. has been pitching well. Go ahead, babyface, say it. Isn't he the greatest number 66 ever in LA? He's not, but okay. How dare you? How yeah. dare you? But I, now I'm wondering if Mitch White, if if Dustin May and Heaney are okay, can you use Mitch White as trade bait? Well, so he, this is what I was going to say. So all that was leading into if they go out and make a Juan Soto deal, they're going to get Diego Cartaya. They're going to get Michael Bush. They're probably going to get Miguel Vargas and probably Andy Pajes. And the dude that I would, you know, because they want a low service time major leaguer, here's Mitch White. Um, that's who I think it, it would be. I don't I don't think that they would trade Bobby Miller or Pepio. Um, I think they would hold on to those guys. Um, Cartaya, because there's a little, I, I said this to you guys in our group text, and Roger thought I was crazy. I think they're going to trade Diego Cartaya. Only because there's a log jam and catcher. They just extended Austin Barnes. And then Will Smith is first. I mean, I don't see how they don't extend Will Smith. That, that's just me when, when his time is up. Um, so Cartaya, who's still relatively young, uh, that that's the perfect trade asset right there. But again, it all depends on what you're going to get because that's a hypothetical for Juan Soto. Because then not only is it just that for Juan Soto, but at some point you got to give the guy $500 million. So, yeah. so for me, that's... That's a lot, and that's even, you know, and I know the Dodgers hoard assets in order to make those sorts of deals, um, a la Trey Turner, Max Scherzer, you know, the, the deal that happened last year with Kiebert and Josiah Gray were kind of the, the focal points of, the, of that trade. Um, I, I just don't know. I, I just don't see that. I feel like that's one of those deals where the Dodgers are like, no, nah, that's too much. And if the Dodgers are saying that's too much, it's too much. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, because, again, the, the, the reporting is the Nationals want four to five prospects and a major leaguer or two with low service time. That, that's kind of how I would, would, would assemble that deal to be. Now, if they are, in fact, going to go get a Luis Castillo, obviously I don't think it'd be that much. Um, I think it would be like a Mitch Wyatt and like a, either like a Pajes or a Michael Bush. You know, that, that's the sort of stuff they're after. So, or even Cartaya. I, I wouldn't be surprised. But, I mean, again, I, I, when you kind of look at this team, you know, if there is a weakness per se, I feel like it's pitching. So if they're going to do any moves, I think it's going to be quiet bullpen moves um, and then maybe trying to get a frontline starter. But they don't really need to make a move for a frontline starter either. That's kind of the position the Dodgers are in too. So here's a question for you guys. So 
it was reported they said that the angels aren't looking or wouldn't do it but i mean if someone comes knocking and they're offering uh shohei otani who would you rather get juan soto if it's going to cost you relatively the same assets juan soto or shohei otani uh me neither that's that's what i would do i wouldn't trade for either of them right now if i had to if you put a gun to my head i would say juan soto yeah, if I had to, I'd trade for so, Juan Soto. So now when when they're on the open market now, if you're the Dodgers, you don't think the Dodgers are going to go after one of these guys? Like, who who would you go for? Like, who who do you think would, would benefit this team better? Juan Soto, if I were to go after the two. Shohei is going to cost you probably $60 million this season. I, I don't that, – that, I mean, that's the thing about Shohei. He, there's going to be – it's going to be a, a once-in-a-lifetime market situation because when's the last time we had a – uh, a unicorn like that in baseball that wasn't named Babe Ruth. So Look, it, the the reason why I'm I I'm hesitant on Otani, I, even though I have so much respect for what he's doing and this is just yeah. amazing to me, is because it's unproven territory here. Okay, how much longer is he going to be able to do both? And that was going to be my point. How long is the sustainability there? Exactly. That's the only thing. But I, I think to me what trumps everything is the fact that Soto is in his early 20s. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you're going to have a guy, and, and I get it. I mean, it's it's a lot of money. and, and But I honestly, the Dodgers, and, and I don't think Friedman subscribes to this anyways. Is I, I don't think he likes long contracts. I, will I, say I know this. Kasten doesn't. I know no. Kasten doesn't. I will say this about Juan Soto. I don't think it's going to be a 13-year deal. I don't think that's what he's wanted. Based on what Scott Boris has publicly said, is that they're pissed about the annual average that he would be paid. So to me, I think Juan Soto wants... That's the irony. He probably wants that Shohei money where it's like $60 million a year for five years. Something like that. Do I think the Dodgers would be willing to do something like that for a Juan Soto? I think so, because it's reported that they offered Bryce Harper like three years, $150 million or something like that. Um, I don't know how true that is, but at the time, that was kind of unprecedented, right? Well, they did the same damn thing with Trevor Bauer. They gave him three years, $103 million. So if it's the annual average that Boris is after, there's not a lot of teams that can afford that sort of money. And I think the Dodgers would listen instead of, okay, we have to pay this guy for 13, 14, 15 years. Instead, we only have to pay him for five. Okay. Like, I, I feel like that's a win-win for both teams, especially because, like you said, I, I agree with you. I don't think Friedman subscribes to the idea of 13 years. Now, people are going to be like, oh, well, Mookie bets. Mookie is an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they also got him at a young age-ish, and it, that, I feel like that's worked out okay, too, because they won a World Series. So that's the, the one kind of caveat, I guess, I will say with Juan Soto. I, I, I agree with you, though, Juan. No, no disrespect to Shohei. No disrespect to anything that he's done. That dude is a unicorn. That dude's a, he's brought back appointment TV watching yep. uh, as far as that goes. I just don't think that the Dodgers need him, if I'm being completely honest with you. And if I if you put a gun to my head, too, I'd trade for Juan Soto out of the two because he's a five-tool guy. What about you, babyface? Who are you going with? Yeah, I, I mean, that's tough. I mean, I... I like what Shohei's been doing, but like you said, you know, how long is that going to last? I mean, even Babe Ruth, right? I mean, he did it he did it for a few seasons, and then he stopped pitching, and he just went strictly hitting. So is that going to be the same for for Shohei? But, yeah, I think I think when you say, you know, I mean, Soto's 23 years old. I mean, even if you just trade for him right now, they would have him, you know, this year and then two more seasons. So they're going to – he's going to be out there contending for, for a team before you have to pay him. Um, so I'd, I'd probably go with Soto as well. And there you have it. I mean, I, look, it, it, I'm very, very excited about the second half of the season. I I can't wait to see, you know, how these things, I mean, the Dodgers are on a roll now. And if they, I mean, it's scary. It's scary to hear the names that may come back. I know they're talking about Walker Bueller in September. That's probably the least confident one that I am in terms of coming back. Uh, but I'm curious to see who, if they do get a starter, another starter, who that starter is in in the second half of the season. Uh, if everybody's gearing up to to try to make the move for Juan Soto, I, I look. I'm the Dodgers, and I call the Marlins, and I just say, "What do you want for Sandy?" You know, if you could, if you could get Sandy Alcantara, then I'll, I'll you know. 
I'm all for that. But one of the other things that I'm looking forward in the second half of the season, and I'm a little disappointed, and I'm curious to hear about you guys, is El Maestro Jaime Jarrín's final season is upon us. I don't feel he's gotten enough love. I don't feel he's gotten enough flowers in the first half of the season. I hope that changes now in the second half of the season. I I hope the Dodgers start making it more about Jaime Jarrín in in, in his final goodbye. I we we were lucky enough to have him on the show, and I, it was it was one of the highlights of being a part of the show. It was actually a chance to to speak to the maestro. For those of you who don't know, this is Jaime Jarrín's last season with the Dodgers. Uh, so please appreciate him. We have a clip. Well, it's not necessarily the, a clip, but it was it was something that I think is pretty awesome that he that he did for us. You know, he he, he gave this show a, a great recommendation. ¿Qué tal, amigos? Les habla su servidor Jaime Jarrín, voz oficial en español de los Dodgers de Los Ángeles, con una recomendación muy especial y sabrosa sobre todo. Les recomiendo la carne asada. Uh, that one was cool. That was a cool one, ha- having him on and hearing his his storytelling. And I, I, I do agree with you. I do think that uh, he hasn't been given the uh, the the. I don't want to say the proper amount because I don't know truly what the proper amount of flowers is. But I feel like it's it's as you always say, Juan. The lead has been buried with him. That uh that he's a uh, th- this is his last year, right? But I also think that's probably how Harin wants it because Harin is not the type to you know even when we talk to him. He didn't want to make it about him. And and I feel like that's just classic Jaime Jarin, where he just kind of flies under the radar. And, and in the process, you hear some really dope stories about just stuff. And, dude, his his story as a whole, if you haven't read up on, on the story and the legend of Jaime Jarin, do it. Because his story is insane. Dude didn't even know what baseball was. And now he's, you know, he's he's enshrined in Dodger lore for the rest of time. As a you know, kind of the, the Latino Vin Scully, right? And I don't even think that's fair comparison, but but it's it's th- that was that was cool. That was that was a really cool one because it's one of those where it's like I'm just gonna listen to you talk, man. I'm just gonna listen to you tell some dope stories, and I'm and, and then you in in the process you kind of reminisce a little bit, you know? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what do you think, Babyface? Do you think he's getting enough credit for his final season? Um, I mean, not as much, and also too, because he, he doesn't he doesn't travel with the team, so. I think if he was traveling with the team, you'd probably see it more with other teams kind of showing their respect to him. So it's just going to, you know, it's just going to be in LA and, and obviously we probably won't hear about it until we get into that final, that final stretch of the season. That's kind of, I think when we'll start seeing more about him in the news and people talking about it. Well, and real quick Juan, before we, uh, we, we dive into our favorite guests too, uh, that we were talking about a second ago. Um, what is your favorite Harin story from that episode? Oh gosh. Uh Yeah, you know, I have to say the 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 Ruben Salazar uh story it, only because I, I I love history, but it just also speaks to the fact that this is a guy who, you know, we just look at him as a baseball broadcaster. Yeah. But he was a journalist. Yeah. You know, he started his career and to be a part to be a piece of especially Los Angeles history. Uh, but the Chicano movement at that time, I, 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 it was like, it was like talking to a, 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 a museum. And I just, I was so, uh, I, I was so just in, engrossed by that. My, uh, my favorite story was, I mean, obviously were the Olympic auditorium stories. Cause those are, are near and dear to me. Cause my dad would talk about that a lot. Uh, but the thriller and Manila, Manila story, how it's crazy to think, that, you know, I mean, because here's the thing, that wasn't in the grand scheme of history. That wasn't that long ago, right? But it feels like it was an eternity ago because, you know, the technology and all that stuff. But just even just the details that he came with, like, like it was like you were still there. But it's been so long that, uh, that uh, you know, he's still able to recollect the way that he does. It's insane. It's insane. But again, that just kind of goes to show... The uh, the 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 lore and the legend of Jaime Harri. Oh no, absolutely. What about you, Babyface? Yeah, I mean, I, I just you know hearing you know his his old stories from you know when he started, um, you know how he started. You know he wasn't even he didn't even know the game of baseball. You know and just uh, 
to to what he's become. I mean, I think just, I mean, everything during during that whole episode, we're just like, you know, just listening, like like you know, like a grandpa or something, you know, telling you these stories of like of times past, and you're just like completely in awe of it. And and I think grateful for for having that opportunity and thankful that that he decided to to give us that time. And you know, I think it was truly truly th- something special for the show. You, know, uh, you, no. you bring up a good point because I think it is absolutely insane that those early broadcasts, he wasn't even watching the game live. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, he was he was broadcasting based on the descriptions that they were giving him of the game. So that, to me, is insane. Uh, one of my other favorite guests, and I, and I think we have a clip of him, uh, was, uh, was Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo stopped by. Uh, another guy that puts it on for, for Los Angeles part of Los Angeles history. Uh, that one was kind of cool because again, kind of the same thing as, as, as Harin. He had some stories and we were just able to listen to him. But uh, if you could rack up that, uh, that clip, uh, Roger. We're here when the Dodgers moved. To, to, so when they moved from Brooklyn to move to LA, you were here right from the beginning. How was it when the Dodgers first moved to LA? And do you have any memories of, of was, being you know a Dodger fan? Uh, you know, I hate to be, like political okay but the dodgers were and baseball in la was kind of a uh american it it, uh, (laughs) it was kind of can i say white can i of course okay yeah it was it was like that was because you know now when fernando came in i'm sorry it was we used to joke that it was a it was a misdemeanor if you got caught on the streets if Fernando was pitching. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> <laughs> they were, that's when, when the Mexicans uh, and the Latinos started going to Chavez Ravine, you know, all him. And, uh, and that's when everybody became a diehard Dodgers. And so we all really, uh, Fernando, you know, just like, oh, that Fernando. He's the sweetest guy in the world. You know what? I was trying to get his autograph, and he was doing a radio uh, station there at Dodger Stadium, and I went to go in, and they stopped me. And, oh, Mr. Taylor, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Nobody can. And it was a poor little old man stopping me. So I'm, okay, all right. I'm not going to argue with you. you know? And so I, I said, okay. And, uh, and he was like, you, but you know what? He went in and told Fernando that Danny Trejo wanted to talk. Fernando came out, and I was like shocked. You know, what I mean? whoa, he's all Trejo, and we hugged. And oh, I got a picture of me and Fernando, and it was like so cool. You know, yeah. I did, man. This guy's, so he's you know, he's like a humble guy. He's not like a, I don't have time, you know. But but uh, but really, he brought he, you know, he brought Latinos in. In, in the Dodger Stadium. Again, the storytelling. You know, it's one of those where you just kind of listen and just let it let it happen. Um, that was one of my favorite guests. That one was cool. I mean, the, the other one that we don't have a clip of was Fluffy. Fluffy was a was a great guest, especially the uh, the wrestling part because Alicia was just lost in the lights. Like, what are they talking about? Um, but uh, it's been it's been a cool first half for us. It's been a cool first half for the season. Uh, I kind of want to hear. Real quick, from, Alonso, from the two, so, of you. Oh, go ahead. tying in the wrestling with Fluffy, I, you know the guest we've had. I think it's been awesome. You know, as uh, I don't know if you guys remember him, Barry Horowitz. You remember Barry Horowitz? <laughs> May yeah. he rest in peace. Yeah. May yeah. he rest let's in let's peace. Give ourselves a yes. <laughs> well, I mean, let's but do like, the Barry Horowitz. Yeah, let's do the Barry Horowitz. But I'm not going to do it because we still have a second half. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to hear from you guys. I want to hear your bold predictions for the second half. I already kind of know what Rogers is going to be, so it's not going to be bold. But, uh, but Juan, go ahead. Uh, I think that, of course, I think the Dodgers are going to win the division. Uh, I think we're going to – I think I think their toughest matchup is going to be in the second round because the way things are lining up right now, hmm. it looks like they are either going to face the Braves, the Bravos, or they'll face the Show Pods. And if it's not the Bravos, they're going to face – if the Bravos end up winning the division, they'll end up facing the Mets in the second round. 
Uh, the show pods, I think if Soto does get traded, I think the show pods are going to be the ones that are going to overpay for him. And I was talking about this with Babyface off the air. I, I, I feel that whatever trade the Dodgers do is different currency. Right. I, I, I don't feel it's apples to oranges because I feel because the Dodgers farm system is so good, whatever prospects they use in a trade, they're already paying a higher price compared to other teams because I don't think other teams' prospects are on the same level as the Dodgers. So if the show pods do get Juan Soto, they're going to have Juan Soto. They're going to have Tatis coming back, which is basically almost like a trade acquisition. Manny Machado's having a great season. And the show pods pitching has already been good. So the issue for the show pods, at least from the times we've seen him this year, is that they don't score. They don't score runs. You're going to add Soto to that lineup and you add Tatis Jr. to that lineup. The show pods might be able to salvage their season if they make that Soto trade. So I, and to your point, I think the show pods are going to make bullpen moves because that's where their biggest, you know, kind of weakest point is aside from the, the run production is, is they don't have a legit bullpen. They have a legit starting rotation. Can't take that away from them. They went and got Sean Manaya. They got their three now, right? Joe Musgrove, yeah. Sean Manaya, and uh, Blake Snell. They just need the bullpen help. You, you forgot you. Well, and the reason I leave out you is because he's, you know, he, he's the other guy, right? The fourth guy, the fourth horse, the four horsemen. Um, but, I mean, you could also flip him. You know, you could take out Snell. You can do you. You can take, you know. So they have options. Where they don't is in the bullpen. Um, but I agree with you, Juan. I, actually, the two teams I think are going to make the overpay for Soto are either the Cardinals or uh, or the Padres. And the funny thing is, is they're they're right there. Like they're they're not terribly far off. Uh, the uh, the Braves are, are are consistently good, but I still think the Dodgers come out of the NL, um, and I think they the Yankees should come out of the AL. I don't see how they don't. I, I don't really know a lot of teams in the American League that can bang with the Yankees, and I know it goes against my original prediction of a uh, uh, Rays Dodgers, but I mean I wouldn't be mad at about a Yankees Dodgers World Series because the Yankees are the second hitting best hitting team behind the Los Angeles Dodgers in all of baseball. So if those are the two, if that's the offenses that we're going to get, inject that directly into my veins for seven games. So you think uh, we're going to see the Clásico then? then I'm hoping for it. I'm hoping. And you know what? That's what baseball needs. It ba yeah. Baseball needs a Clásico. For a long time, like for instance in world soccer, era el Barcelona and Real Madrid, right? Everywhere. Champions League finals. La Liga, Torpedo. We haven't had that in baseball for a long time. You know, obviously you had the, you know, it was, it's been 18 years since the famed 2004 brawl of the Yankees and, and the Red Sox, right? Yeah. We haven't had a, a you know, the, those sorts of a, a, a rivalries for a long time. Not to say that the Yankees and Dodgers are a rivalry. I'm just saying El Clasico, I think, is what baseball needs to be able to kind of get it to the forefront uh, of, of everything. So I think that that's my hot take. I think it'll be a Yankees Dodgers World Series. And, uh, and like I said, if that's the offense, if, if those are the two offenses we're going to get every single night, inject it directly into my veins. And I hate needles. I absolutely hate needles. <laughs> so if that's, if that's what it's going to take for us to get the Yankees and Dodgers World Series, let's go. What about you, Roger? Yeah, I, th I think they, they make, they're going to make a, a move. Uh, I think it's going to be pitching, though. I mean, they, they got to get, you know, because when we talk about, you know, the playoffs and those short series, you know, say you're going up against the Mets, right? You're going to see. Probably DeGrom's back, Scherzer's back. So who are the Dodgers rolling out? You know, Kershaw, and then is it Gonsolin? I mean, does that sound, you know, sexy against, you know, Scherzer, you know, Gonsolin? Like, I mean, I don't – I mean, he's been the man, but uh, just on on another level. Like, I think they need another guy, maybe like a Luis Castillo, just to shore up that, that rotation. So I think they're going to make a move uh, for pitching. Uh, it's going to be pitching probably that and bullpen help and – and then, you know, we'll go from there. I mean, obviously, I think they're going to make it out. They'll, they'll be the NL team. Um, and then on the other side, you know, Yankees, Yankees seem like the favorite, but the Astros have been banging with them. Yeah. And, and you guys you guys, didn't, you guys missed that, right? They've been banging with them. Well, we, we, uh, uh, we left. Well we, played, we, sir. Well we, played. We left it up for you there uh, to, uh, to to pitch off or hit off the tee. Uh, that, that was almost Jeb Bush-like what you just was. did. P please laugh. So, so, please laugh. So I mean you don't Golf know. Clock. I mean it, you know, uh, it could be Astros coming out, and then you know you have another Dodgers Astros, Dodgers Yankees. So let me ask you this: Are you saying that because you want that? 
for 2.0? Or are you saying that because you legitimately believe that? And that's a sincere question. And I'm not even going with the Prince of Darkness bit because that's that's been taken from. No, I, I, mean, I, I believe that. I mean, I'd I'd want to see them get that revenge against the Astros. Um, but you know, at you know, at this point, it's like, hey, whoever. Whoever, whoever's in the way, right? Drew Nat. Uh, uh, no disrespect to Tony Gonsolin, who basically just got called a scrub by well, uh, Roger. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying by mainstream media, when you, when, you, when you see, okay, you're going to have, when you put up, you know, your best pitchers, like, right, like, who's going to say, oh, Tony Gonsolin, like, that's the thing with the All-Star game. Like, if you're Tony Gonsolin, half, half the country would have been like, who the heck's Tony Gonsolin, right? But we know what Tony Gonsolin can do. But I'm just saying... In general, when you look at it, when everybody's like, oh, let me tune into this game, and they're going to be like, Tony Gonsolin, you know? you know? They don't know Tony Gonsolin. But you know what? You know what would help them? Is if they put him on the platform so the entire country could see, because yeah. that's what baseball needs. And not calling him a scrub would also help, too. Because, cause, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, baseball does a fantastic job of getting in their own damn way. And and if they would just just stop that, and then get the likes of Tony Gonsal and Tyler Anderson, and and not even just with the Dodgers, Jazz Chisel, you know, Sandy Alcantara, all these other guys that that play baseball in a fun way. Even Tim Anderson, like those are the guys that if they did it, they'd be just like the casual NBA fans that know who Gary Payton Jr. is. You know, you, you know those those the, the casual fans that people make fun of. But what do I know? I'm just a small brown guy in a podcast. Uh, Juan. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, do you still have the uh, the Dodgers in the World Series? Uh, yeah, I I do, but I'm, I'm not as confident as you guys. Uh, oh, the, right, right. the playoffs are a completely different animal, and I and I just uh, to to Roger's point about the sexiness, you know, when you have a pitching staff, I, I'm very curious to see what Gonsolin looks like in the second half because I'm already hearing people that they got to limit, they got to bring down his innings and conserve him because he's never pitched this much. Right. And so it's like, if we're doing that, I mean, we're not saying that about Sandy Alcantara. We're not saying all, all these guys who have better ERAs than Gonsolin have pitched more innings than Gonsolin. So uh, I'm very curious to see, only because it's also the Alex Wood factor from 2017. Alex Wood was 11 and 0, and then in the second half in that year was a different pitcher, but he pitched well in the postseason. So I would like to see Gonsolin do that. Um, so that's why I'm I'm just nervous because you run into two hot pitchers. I mean, if Degrom and Scherzer go nuts, what are you going to do? I mean, if Max Fried you know, goes nuts in the and can shut down the Dodgers in a short series. I, I mean, that's that's what's concerning because we've seen the Dodgers do it themselves. You know, go back to Hershiser. Hershiser almost single handedly beat the Mets in that series. Uh, yeah. Well, and you're going to get an opportunity to watch Tony pitch tonight against uh, Paolo Espino. Uh, they they start their uh, their set against the uh, the Washington Nationals at Dodger Stadium tonight. Uh, uh, as of this, and ironically, he's 11 and 0. So and that and that and that start is very interesting to me, uh, Alonso, because he didn't look good against the Cardinals. And uh, Dodger fans, I want to remind you guys, he lost the All Star game. He got rocked in that inning. Got, he got hit hard. Yeah, what? It, it, it was. It wasn't. Look, yeah. What? Maybe this is why people call me the Prince of Darkness. But let's look at it, guys. He did not look good against the Cardinals. And then in the All Star game, Stanton took him deep. And then he gave up the other home run to um, Buxton. To Buxton. Buxton. Yeah. You know, and those were the three runs, the three runs that won the American League the All Star game. So that's why I'm curious if Gonsolin goes on the bump today, mind you, yeah, it's against the Nationals. But if he looks sharp against the Nationals today, then okay, then maybe it's just one of those things. And Roger, you have a uh, we we can book it that uh, you have the Dodgers winning the World Series against the Yankees and or the uh, the the Astros. Dodgers in six. Oh, you don't even want the seven. Oh, okay, all right. I just want the seven because it's best for baseball in my yeah opinion. yeah I agree in, in my opinion. Uh, but again, I digress. What, what do I know? Um, but we want to thank you guys too for uh for for riding with us, all you listeners, subscribers, all that good stuff because uh. I say it in, in, in a lot of my opens. If it wasn't for you guys, we uh, we wouldn't be doing the cool stuff that we're doing. And that uh, that All Star Game watch party that was fun. Uh, even though Juan wasn't there, uh, that's probably what made it funner. 
<laughs> is there wasn't a cloud of darkness that just kind of rolled over at Lee Hot Wings, and uh, and we were able to uh, to enjoy it. But it was cool getting to know some of some of our listeners in person. Philip, uh, who uh, who stands with Juan, uh, also advised me to keep up the Fight Club with Juan. So I'm going to do that. Per, per the you, you got you got to honor the requests. So, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and Simeon, some other guys that were there. Uh, it, it was great to to meet you guys in person, especially with how much you guys interact with us online. So if you haven't. Follow us. Uh, we all have our socials all over the place. And even though Alicia isn't here, she would also ask the same thing. Follow us. You know, engage with us. And also for you guys listening, chime in when, you know, you see the, the thread for this episode. Tell us your second half take as far as what you expect for the Dodgers or even trades. I'm kind of curious to hear what you guys think because obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, it's all speculation as far as trades go, right? But the Dodgers have a knack of pulling stuff just completely out of thin air and making stuff happen. So anything is possible because it's that time of the year. But again, we can't thank you guys enough. And we also can't thank Ben Online enough. Ben Online uh, has presented this week's episode of the podcast. Uh, if you head on over to benonline.ag or use your mobile device to join today and you make your first sports bet, use our promo code, which is believe B L E A V five zero to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Ben online where the game starts. You could also make bets on uh, on the wager, or I'm sorry, on the, on the thing we were just talking about, who are the Dodgers going to play in the World Series. If you think that it's going to be against the Yankees, the Astros, whoever, you can make those bets at Bet Online. Bet Online where the game starts. Huge thanks to them. And again, can't thank you guys enough. Can't thank Believe enough on the network that we're on uh, for everything. It's been a it's been a fun first half. I uh, I can't complain. The only thing I'm, I'm complaining about is uh, uh, that it's the first half. Like the first half is over. Like the season's flown by like that, and now we're heading in uh, my favorite time of the year, the fall, um, which is not as hot as it currently is either. That's that's also why I like the fall. But uh, we're gonna wrap this thing up. Thanks again from your boys Alonso y Juan, Babyface Gimmick in the Sky, and Aisha Del Valle. Uh, thank you guys again. We will catch you down the road and go Dodgers.